Honourable members and senators, distinguished visitors, ladies and gentlemen, and children, I now invite Auntie Tina Brown, Ngunnawal elder, to welcome us to the traditional country of the Ngunnawal people on which Parliament House stands. This is the first stage of the opening of the 46th Parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia. Auntie Tina, after she has spoken, will lead a traditional cleansing dance before we ask the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition to reply. So I invite Auntie Tina. There's no water. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to the beautiful lands of the Ngunnawal. My name is Tina Brown, and I stand here in honour of my parents, Carl and Louise Brown, and all of the Ngunnawal people and our ancestors to conduct this welcome to country. I also acknowledge my brothers, Anthony, Justin, and Adrian, and my sister Nevada, and my extended family, for their love and support. I am a proud Ngunnawal woman, a descendant of the Browns and Bells on my father's side, and the Williams and Freemans on my mother's side. I am truly a woman of the fresh water, and not surprising, since I was raised on this beautiful country where the Murrumbidgee flows. Some of you know it as the big river, but for us it will always be the pathway of bosses which forms part of the land, connecting us to the three rivers and to our Iradjuri cousins. I also begin by acknowledging the elders, mine and yours, and those who are here today. I thank you for being here and thank you for your long life efforts towards building a legacy that you are proud to leave to those who follow you. To all our, our, all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, I acknowledge the deep connection to people and the country, and I stand here in awe of a legacy that has been tens and thousands of years in the making. I also acknowledge Mr. Scott Morrison, Prime Minister of Australia, Mr. Anthony Albanese, Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Ken Wyatt, Minister for Indigenous Affairs, and other Aboriginal members of Parliament, Senator Patrick Dodson, Mrs Linda Burney, Senator Malandiri McCarthy, and Senator Jackie Lambie, and other honourable senators and members. You, along with your fellow, fellow and former national leaders, have been meeting here on the ancestral lands for 92 years, progressing the social, cultural, and economic interests of the nation. I wish you well in this 46th Parliament, Last, lastly, I acknowledge you, my fellow Australians, 
and especially those of you who helped grow and shape me. For it is this, the dust of the bones of my ancestors and the dust of the bones of your ancestors that mingle together, shaping this land, uniting us as custodians of the future. As you know, Canberra is a local word meaning meaning place. We would say that the leaders of our nation and surrounding nations have been meeting on this land forever. But science tells us that this, is, this connection is about 25,000 years or more than a thousand generations of my family. Our ancestors formed pathways across this land to guide us, linking our areas of significance, such as Mount Majura and Mount Ainsley and Black Mountain and the major meeting ground right here in this very site where Parliament House sits today. I also have the privilege of welcoming you to the lands of the Ngunnawal. Every time I do a welcome, I show respect to our ancestors and our people for their continuing leadership and for our ever-evolving contribution to this region. Every time you ask me or one of my sisters or brothers across Australia to do a welcome, you are showing respect to our people and our achievements. I truly feel responsi a responsibility towards the thousand generations who went before me and the obligation of a thousand generations who will follow me. This long connection to people and place is a unique gift to Australia and the world. At the end of this ceremony, we will invite you to join us in a smoking ceremony, one of the most important ancient ceremonies. This ceremony is used as a cleansing ritual and to ward off bad spirits. When you move around the fire pit, let the smoke roll over you and let it come through you and brace within you. Smoke and fire are important to our mob. My late father, King Brown, or also known as Carl Brown, worked with ACT Parks and Conservation to bring back cultural burning. He taught us to think about why we are burning and what it's about. Our nation needs to create solutions, drawing on the wisdom of the ancient Australia and the wisdom of the modern Australia, and in the progress creating you, transformed way, the way that unites us all. I welcome you to the lands of the Ngunnawal, and during this 46th parliament, I wish you all the courage and wisdom you need to do just this. Welcome to the beautiful lands of the Ngunnawal. I now also have the pleasure of introducing all the Ngunnawal beautiful dancers who have been performing our women's dances. So I would just like to welcome my cousin brother Billy T, my son Joby King Brown, my cousin Tiana, my nephew Darius, my niece Kelani, my daughter Justina, my niece Minnie, and my other niece Melissa, and my other niece Dakota, all my nieces. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, on behalf of my elders, past, present and emerging, welcome the ancestral lands of my people.
I now invite the Prime Minister to respond to the Welcome to Country. Can I begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, in whose land we meet, their elders past, present and emerging. Our parliament indeed meets on Ngunnawal land. Can I particularly, though, thank you, Auntie Tina, and your beautiful family uh, for the incredible welcome you've provided to us here today. It's not the first time I've been the beneficiary of your welcome, and my family has been a beneficiary of your welcome. There is a spirit of grace about you, Tina, and your family, which is truly overwhelming. And where there is a spirit of grace, there will always be the pathway for reconciliation. And I want to thank you for bringing that here today very, very much. Here, 65,000 years of Aboriginal culture meets mere centuries of Westminster tradition, which the Leader of the Opposition and I represent in being here together. And I acknowledge Anthony, as I do all of my parliamentary colleagues, the Deputy Prime Minister, who joins us here today. We gather in respect, acknowledging the Ngunnawal elders. The ancient ceremony of fire and smoke that will commence shortly has become part of the tradition of this building, and thankfully so. It was just over a decade ago that the first ever smoking ceremony was accompanied the opening of parliament. And I thank the Speaker and the President of the Senate for their continuing support of this, as it shall always be in this place. We couldn't imagine this day without this ceremony, and nor should we. It is appropriate that the entrance of our parliament just beyond the great veranda is the beautiful mosaic on the forecourt. Michael Nelson Jagamara's possum and wallaby dreaming, brush tail possums, red kangaroos, rock wallabies and more. Jagamara's dreaming ancestors all gathering for an important ceremony, stirring in its subtlety. As the artist said himself, the 90,000 hand guillotined granite pieces present and represent a place where all people come and meet together, just like we do in our ceremonies to discuss and work things out together. And that captures the work, the job of this place to work things out together. <clears throat> in my maiden speech to Parliament, I said that a strong country is at peace with its past. And this is a work in progress. Being at peace with our past, being at one with our past. And while we reflect on how far we have to go, consider though how far we have come. This year, my government appointed Ken Wyatt as the first ever Aboriginal person to hold the position of Minister for Indigenous Australians and as a member for Cabinet. And I welcome him here and, and this morning. But I am also pleased, as I know that the Leader of the Opposition is, that he will be joined in the parliament by the member for Barton, Linda Burney, and Senators Patrick Dodson, Malandira McCarthy and Jackie Lambie. But together, between Linda and Ken, I think Anthony and I are both very optimistic about the partnership that can be forged. Indigenous, important voices that I am confident will be joined by many, many more in the years to come. It was a different story at the official opening of what we now call the Old Parliament House back in 1927. Not a single first Australian was invited to celebrate. However, that didn't stop two men, Jimmy Clements, better known as King Billy, and John Noble. They left their home at Brungle Mission near Gundagai and began the long walk to Canberra. They trudged over the mountains until they had arrived in our nation's capital. The 80-year-old King Billy stood firm and front of the new parliament and protested his sovereign rights to the federal territory. The police ordered him to move on, fearing his shabby clothes and the dogs at his bare feet would offend the sensibilities of the Duke and Duchess of York, who were in attendance. But an incredible thing happened. The crowd, Australians, took King Billy's side. They called on him to stand his ground, and he did. A clergyman declared that he had a better right than any man present to be there, and that was true. King Billy won that fight, 
and the next day he was among those citizens officially presented to the Duke and Duchess. His long walk to Canberra paid off. Almost eight decades later, footballing great Michael Long would also begin a long walk to Canberra and would famously meet with the then Prime Minister John Howard to discuss the issues facing Indigenous communities. And as Michael's wife Leslie put it so well, when one person starts walking, someone will walk next to them. And they'll say, I believe in that too. I'll walk with you. So here we are, walking together. All Australians, Indigenous or not, walking together, side by side, towards reconciliation, towards equal opportunities, towards closing that gap once and for all, walking in the same way a determined, steely-eyed, 80-year-old Radri man walked to Canberra almost a century to go. We have a long way to go, we know, but we will walk that journey together. Thank you. I thank the Prime Minister and invite the Leader of the Opposition to respond. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal people of the land on which we meet and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. To the Prime Minister, to Mr Speaker, my parliamentary colleagues, uh, fellow citizens. I particularly acknowledge the presence here today of uh, met the members of parliament who are Indigenous Australians. Uh, Minister Wyatt, I congratulate you, Ken, very much on your appointment. It is indeed a historic occasion. To my local member, Linda Burney, who will be his shadow uh, minister, and I am confident, the, without, I, I don't think I'm breaking a confidence here to say that uh, when uh, the Prime Minister uh, and I eventually got together to chat about uh, my uh, election as leader of the Labor Party, uh, the one issue that we discussed was reconciliation. It was the first agenda in which we need to cooperate as a parliament, not as partisan uh, political uh, operators. And I am very confident that both uh, Minister Wyatt and Shadow Minister Burney, along with uh, her colleagues as well, uh, Senator Dodson, uh, Senator Malandiri McCarthy and Senator Jackie Lambie uh, will also participate uh, in that process and in that, that journey. Uh, thank you, Tina, to uh, yourself and your wonderful family. Uh, what a fantastic performance uh, to begin uh, this, uh, this eventful day in Parliament House. I am so grateful to be welcomed again to Ngunnawal country by the traditional owners here. Uh, Linda said to me this morning, Wellama, we'll be back. We always do come back. Uh, when I was elected to this uh, place some 23 years ago, there was no welcome to country, simply because the Parliament didn't ask for one. I came down from a a lifetime in the inner west of Sydney, uh, the land of the gadigal Wongal clans of the Eora Nation, to a new career here in this Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, without any acknowledgement of the cultural significance of that moment. What a lost opportunity to learn about this place. Uh, we now begin every shadow ministry meeting with the acknowledgement of country from Linda Burney, who informs us about uh, the cultural significance of where we are meeting wherever it is. Just like, of course, the parliament didn't ask to be welcomed by your leaders when we first met in this building in 1988, nor when we first met in this city in 1927. But even when the parliament has tried to ignore First Nations, First Nations people have been here, and the Prime Minister has outlined uh, that extraordinary uh, history with Jemmy Clements and uh, John Noble, uh, proud Wiradjuri men, and the actions that they took and the response that they got from their fellow Australians. I also think of the first welcome to country here 
when we gathered in this place in February of 2008. I'm very proud to have been Leader of the House of Representatives when we instituted that reform. It's a great example of whereby I think people at the time thought, why haven't we done this before? And once done, just like the apology, uh, no one could imagine us not doing it. It was indeed a rare moment where the Parliament showed humility and respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. What I remember most from that February day was the same strength, the strength of your culture to survive everything that has been thrown at you, to survive everything that this institution has done to you, and the strength of your character to welcome us with the oldest continuing human culture and custom in the world, customs whose antiquity stretches back beyond our comprehension. The generosity of First Nations people to offer that welcome is quite extraordinary. So I welcome uh, the fact that uh, we now regard this as an essential component of the beginning of the parliament. We know that for parliament to be asked to be welcomed by the traditional owners of the land on which we meet is a very modest step. It's more than a decade since the apology. It is time to go further in reconciliation. The parliament should show its respect for the strength and determination of First Nations peoples by working with you to progress the agenda of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, to establish a voice, to recognise First Nations people in our constitution and to close the gap which remains so vast across so many categories. We have to acknowledge the patience and persistence of First Nations people and their wishes, including the nature of future agreements with them that was made clear in the Uluru Statement. The Parliament should do more than hear an Aboriginal welcome. The Parliament should also hear an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. That would be a significant change for our country. We would all be stronger for it, and once done, we would wonder, just like with the apology, just like this welcome to country, why we hadn't done it before. So I say to the Prime Minister, I look forward to working with you in the spirit in which we've already had discussions. We will work with you. This thing can be done. We've been welcomed to this country today in such a generous spirit, by such a hopeful heart, and we should respond with courage, with kindness and with determination. 45 times we have opened the parliament in this country without a voice to parliament for the First Nations of this great land. This 46th parliament should be the last time in which we do that. Thank the Leader of the Opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, the Welcome to Country will continue and conclude in the, on the Great Veranda with a smoking ceremony. But before we do that, can we please all thank Auntie Tina, her family and our dancers. The usher of the Black Rod and I will lead the dancers out through the marble foyer, followed by Auntie Tina and the dancers and the official party. Um, then will come the first two rows and then we invite you all to follow us after that. Thank you.
Now to the opposition leader, Josie, over here. Mr. Albanese, same thing.
as well. Honourable Senators, a proclamation from the former Governor General. I, General the Honourable Sir Peter Cosgrove, aka MC Retired, Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia, acting under Section 5 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia, appoint Tuesday, 2 July 2019, at 10.30 am as the day and time for the Parliament to meet at Parliament House to hold a session of the Parliament and summon all senators and members of the House of Representatives to meet at that day, time and place. Signed and sealed with the Great Seal of Australia on 19th June 2019, signed Sir Peter Cos Cosgrove, Governor General, countersigned by His Excellency's Command, Scott Morrison, Prime Minister. Honourable Senators, the Deputy of the Excellency, the Governor General, and the Honourable Justice Gagler approach the Senate. Honourable Senators, please be seated. Black Rod, please let the members of the House of Representatives know that I desire their attendance in the Senate. Honourable Members, the Usher of the Black Rod with a message from his Deputy of the, His Excellency, the Governor-General. Honourable Members, the Deputy of His, of his Excellency, the Governor-General, desires her attendance in the Senate.
Senators, members of the House of Representatives, His Excellency the Governor-General has appointed me as his deputy to declare open the Parliament of the Commonwealth. The Clerk of the Senate will now read the instrument of appointment.
Appointment of a Deputy to the Governor-General to declare open the Parliament. I, General the Honourable David Hurley, AC, DSC, retired, Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia, acting under section 126 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia and Clause 4 of the Letters Patent dated 21 August 2008 relating to the office of Governor-General, appoint the Honourable Susan Mary Kiefel, AC, Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, to be my deputy to declare open the Parliament of the Commonwealth at the time and place appointed by the proclamation published in the Commonwealth of Australia Gazette on the 21st of June 2019. Dated 1st July 2019, David Hurley, Governor-General, countersigned by His Excellency's Command, Scott Morrison, Prime Minister. Pursuant to the instrument which the clerk has now read, I declare open the 46th Parliament of the Commonwealth. His Excellency the Governor-General has commanded me to let you know that, after Senators and members of the House of Representatives have been sworn, the Governor-General will declare in person at this place the cause of his calling the Parliament together. Before that time, it is necessary for the Senate to choose its President and for the House of Representatives to choose its Speaker. Later today, you will present those you have chosen to the Governor-General. The Honourable Justice Gagler will now attend in the House of Representatives to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance to honourable members of that House. Honourable Senators, Honourable Senators, His Excellency the Governor-General has authorised me to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance to Senators elected on 18th May 2019, as required by Section 42 of the Constitution. I call the Clerk to read the Commission.
authority to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance to senators. I, General the Honourable David Hurley, AC, DSC, retired, Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia, acting under section 42 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia, authorised the Honourable Susan Mary Kiefel, AC, Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance to senators, dated 1st July 2019, signed David Hurley, Governor General, countersigned by His Excellency's Command, Scott Morrison, Prime Minister. I call the clerk to table the certificates of election. I lay on the table the certificates of election of senators elected on 18 May 2019. Will honourable senators please come to the table as their names are called to make and subscribe the oath or affirmation of allegiance? Will the following senators representing New South Wales please come to the table? Holly Hughes, Tony Sheldon, Andrew Bragg, Tim Ayres, Perrin Davey, Maureen Faruqi. Will those senators making oaths please take the Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, Tony Sheldon, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators roll. <laughs> Just like in the rehearsal. Following senators representing Queensland, please come to the table. Paul Scar, Nita Green, Susan MacDonald, Malcolm Roberts, Jared Rennick, Larissa Waters. Will those senators making oaths please take your Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, Mr. Roberts, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators' roll.
Will the following senators representing South Australia please come to the table? Anne Ruston, Alex Gallagher, David Fawcett, Marielle Smith, Sarah Hanson Young, Alex Antich. Will those senators making oaths please, recite, please take your Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, Alex Gallagher, do swear to swear and faithfully and bear true allegiance to the majesty queen of the second, heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. Sign the test roll and the senators roll. Will the following senators representing Tasmania please come to the table? Richard Colbeck, Carol Brown, Claire Chandler, Nick McKim, Katrina Billick, Jackie Lambie. Will those senators making oaths please take your Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, I Richard Colbert, do swear that I will be faithfully and true allegiance to the majesty queen of the second legion. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators roll. Will the following senators representing Victoria please come to the table? James Patterson, Raf Ciccone, Jane Hume, Jess Walsh, Janet Rice, 
David Van. <laughs> Will those senators making oaths please take your Bible in your right hand? And senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators roll. Will the following senators representing Western Australia please come to the table? Linda Reynolds, Patrick Dodson, Slade Brockman, Matt O'Sullivan, Louise Pratt, Jordan Steele John. Will those senators making oaths please take your Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, I pledge allegiance to, to swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Her heirs and successors according to law. I, Jordan Steele John, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will bear faithful and true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to the law. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators' roll.
Will the following senators please come to the table? Representing the Australian Capital Territory, Katie Gallagher, Zed Seselja. Representing the Northern Territory, Malandiri McCarthy, Sam McMahon. Will those senators making oaths please take your Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, Zedzi Selja, do swear that I'll be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen of England the second, her heirs and successors, according to law, so help me God. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators' roll. Uh, Clark, I remind the Senate that it should now choose one of its members to be president. Uh, I move that Senator Ryan take the chair of the Senate as president. Are there any further nominations? <laughs> Senator Di Natale. Move that Senator Nick McKim from Tasmania Yay! be nominated as president of the Senate. <laughs> Are there any further nominations, Senators? There being two nominations, I invite the candidates to address the Senate. Senator Ryan. Thanks, Senator Cormann, and I submit myself to the will of the Senate. Yeah. 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 Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, as uh, Senator Ryan has done, I submit myself to the will of the Senate. But in doing so, I want to make a couple of points. Firstly, I've accepted this nomination to draw attention to the stitch up between the major parties that underpins so much of how this place operates. Make no mistake. Uh, and in fact, the level of interjection here is exactly why we need a Green senator sitting in the president's chair, because this place is not a cosy club, and it should not operate as a cosy club, where the major parties get together and stitch up so much of how this place operates, just as they do, just as they do in the other place and just as they've done historically in the Senate. Let me make a blindingly obvious observation. The government does not have a majority in the Senate. This Senate has not been given a mandate by the Australian people to pass the government's agenda unaltered. If that's what the people wanted, they would have put the government in a majority in this place. 
but they didn't. They've elected a balance of power Senate. And for too long, the major parties have used their collective majority in this place to determine how the Senate operates. And you only have to have a look at the other closed shops in this parliament, for example, the Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and Security, how that's worked in this place, stitched up by the major parties, and now we've got the ABC being raided by the AFP. This cosy stitch up between the major parties is not serving our country and it is not serving the people of Australia. I've accepted the nomination for this, uh, for this role on behalf of the well over a million people who voted for the Australian Greens at this election, who voted to shake up politics, who voted for strong action on climate, who voted for strong action to address the extinction crisis facing this planet. And I say to the major parties, if you can't feel the ice cracking under you, if you can't feel the fragility of our institutions starting to crumble in this country, you are not paying close enough attention. The Australian Greens are here to shake up politics. We are here to shake up business as usual, and we are here to shake up the way this Senate operates. And I ask all senators, particularly my crossbench colleagues, for their support. As there are two nominees, a ballot will now be held. Before proceeding to ballot, the bells will be rung for four minutes.
Senators, the Senate will now proceed to ballot. Ballot papers will be distributed. Please vote on the ballot paper. Uh, please write on the ballot paper the name of the candidate you wish to vote for. The candidates are Senator Ryan and Senator McKim. If all senators have had time to vote, the ballot papers will now be collected. Into box.
I invite Senators Dean Smith and Rachel Seawitt to act as scrutineers.
announce the results of the ballot as follows. Senator Gavin Marshall, one vote. <laughs> Senator, <laughs> Senator Nick McKim, Senator Nick McKim, ten votes. Senator the Honourable Scott Ryan, sixty-two votes. Senator the Honourable Scott Ryan is therefore elected President of the Senate in accordance with the standing orders. Well, I thank Senator Cormann for the nomination. I thank the Senate for the faith that it has expressed in me to, to continue to serve, uh, and I will continue to serve the interests of the entire Senate and all senators as I have endeavoured to over the last 19 months. And I make one final promise, which is that I will see those doors get finished eventually. <laughs> uh, so thank you all. Um, the Senate is adjourned until... Oh, oh, sorry, one more. Um, well, uh, Congratulations, uh, Mr. President, and in congratulating uh, you, I would like to thank uh, the opposition for uh, acting consistent uh, with convention, as we do, in uh, supporting the government's nominee for president. Uh, you are, in many ways, a perfect fit uh, for the position of uh, president. You are trusted, you are fair, you are impartial, you have a deep understanding of parliamentary democracy, Westminster traditions, the Constitution, Australian political history, and indeed you have a, a deep uh, love of the Senate uh, as a central institution of parliamentary uh, democracy. You have presided over our proceedings so far as our uh, past as well as our future president uh, with um, good humour and uh, the appropriate levels of uh, independence, and we wish you well uh, in uh, reassuming your office. Thank you. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. And I rise on behalf of the opposition to congratulate you on your re-election as President of the Senate. Uh, fairness and impartiality are obviously key attributes for any person holding this position, especially in this chamber, which is the only chamber in the parliament in which executive government can actually be held to account, given the numbers in the House of Representatives. We know you recognise you hold this position on the trust of the Senate, not as a partisan. We also know that you have a deep respect for principles and conventions of our democracy, such as the separation of powers and the principle of ministerial accountability, principles which perhaps more in this parliament might recognise. We recognise you also hold a deep respect for the role the Senate has in Australia's democracy, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Senator Di Natale. Mr President, I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to congratulate you on your appointment. Um, it was a close run thing and uh, we are, uh, uh, clearly uh, we are disappointed that uh, our candidate, uh, Senator McKim, wasn't uh, elected. Uh, clearly the election of President is a gift of the Senate. It doesn't belong uh, to either uh, of the major parties. Uh, we think this is one of many conventions that uh, don't serve the parliament well, and we do think that uh, having someone from the crossbench would make this a much more lively and interesting uh, chamber. Uh, having said that, uh, we are um, assured that you will continue to do your role assiduously, uh, independently, um, and as uh, one of the uh, few people uh, who ha has been booted out of this place by you, uh, I hope uh, that that tra tradition uh, will not continue uh, through this parliament. Thank you. I thank senators for their kind words. Um, the sitting of the Senate is suspended until the ringing of the bells. Attitude of this house for his service. The attendants, the librarians, the cleaners, the drivers and all the support staff make up the team that serve us here in this place, and you lead that team, Mr Speaker, in your own inimitable way. Those who work for the parliament watch over this institution. They don't just serve us, the members, but more importantly, they serve the Australian people. And as we come together here for this first time in this place, we all know that our focus should be not on the people who are inside this building, but indeed to serve those who are outside this building, who will always remain our focus. So we thank you again for your work in advance in shepherding this 46th parliament as its speaker. 
And Mr Speaker, I look forward and the government looks forward to working with you as we have always done so in the past. God bless and I wish you all the best in your endeavours and responsibilities. Yeah. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. On behalf of the Opposition, I offer you my sincere congratulations on your re-election to the Office of Speaker. I congratulate all those new members of Parliament and I say to them that you can be an MP without being a parliamentarian. The Speaker is indeed a parliamentarian in the truest sense of the Westminster tradition. Uh, you love this institution, uh, you're passionate about it, and uh, you bring great credit uh, to all of us uh, with the way that you conduct yourself. Of course, uh, we on this side of the House would have preferred a different result on May 18. <laughs> But I'm pleased to see that you're back in control of the House. You are as fair and impartial a speaker as I've seen on either side of politics in my more than two decades in this House. And indeed, uh, Mr Speaker, you are for the third time un elected unopposed. That is the first time that that has occurred in more than a century since the beginning of indeed this parliament going back to federation. Uh, the fact that you've been nominated by the government side and seconded by the opposition side is to your credit and also, I think, uh, will be welcomed by Australians who want to see solutions rather than arguments in this place, wherever that is possible. Of course, from time to time, uh, it will be the case that there are arguments, uh, but uh, you've always conducted yourself with diligence, grace and good humour, and that has assisted, I think, in focusing attention uh, from members of this House uh, on outcomes and more what unites us rather than what divides us in the legitimate debates and contests that will take place over the future direction of this country. Uh, we at times uh, will be passionate. Uh, I will be too, you might notice. But uh, what we need to do always is to recognise that the standing orders and the procedures that are in place uh, are here so that those debates are conducted in a way that produces outcomes and really focuses on the needs of the Australian people rather than on ourselves. And you have always conducted yourself in that way. Of course, your task is more than just chairing the parliament. As the Prime Minister has said, uh, you also lead the parliament in terms of the officers, the clerks, all who work to make this institution operate on a day-to-day -day basis. And you do that in a way which has always been consultative, particularly over some difficult issues. Uh, national security is a much greater issue today uh, than it was uh, when I and yourself were elected uh, those years ago. And it's important to get that balance between the openness of a parliament whereby people can come along and can hear debates and participate uh, with uh, those uh, national needs. Your job also is to be the representative of the parliament of all of us, which is why it's important that you've been elected unopposed. I've welcomed you to my electorate on, uh, on two occasions where you've attended uh, Birchgrove Public School and spoken to uh, the young primary school kids there. And I know that uh, you've travelled to places like Broken Hill and right around the country to talk to school children. I think it's a really good sign, uh, particularly uh, when, uh, I must say, when you've been welcomed into uh, electorates not held by government members, that they get to see that uh, what they see on the nightly news of the 30 second grab isn't everything that happens in this place, and indeed that the institution of parliament and Westminster democracy is something that we shouldn't take for granted. Australians do understand that politics is about a contest of ideas. I'm convinced that uh, Australians do want less argument and more outcomes. You've achieved an outcome today, which is a good one for you, but a good one for the parliament. And I say on behalf of Labor, uh, that uh, to the Prime Minister that our nation looks to see what we can deliver uh, for them in the 46th Parliament. I'm up for it. We're up for it. Let's begin later today. The Leader of the House. I'm sorry, the Deputy Prime Minister. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations on your re-election. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you are fair, sometimes even funny. You are. <laughs> you are measured. You are considered. You are impartial. You are everything a speaker should be, and you're the only speaker in the parliament since I've been here in 2010 who has not thrown me out. In fact, there's always time. There's always time. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, I don't think you've even threatened to throw me out under Section 94A. The member for Parks has, when he was Deputy Speaker, filling in the yes, member for Sydney, there is still time. But, uh, but the member for McKellar certainly threw me out. But, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the National Party and certainly on behalf of rural and regional Australia, I want to say congratulations. I want to say uh, good luck. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I don't uh, give up. Uh, private conversations uh, with other members of parliament, uh, but I'm going to because I know the person. <laughs> I'm going to publicly, and I'm going to at the dispatch box. And it was the member for Grainley. We were sitting on a plane uh, going to Sydney one time, and uh, and in a, uh, a free and frank conversation, the member for Grainley said, uh, "Tony Smith is a very, very good speaker, a very good speaker, and uh, he extolled your virtues as I do today, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know that you care deeply about." the Westminster system. I know that you care deeply about tradition. I know that you care deeply about the future. And I know also that you care deeply about rural and regional Australia, which of course is so important for myself, for the National Party in particular, for the government and indeed all parliamentarians, particularly at this time of drought, because the Speaker has on several occasions phoned me to ask about my own electorate, to ask about uh, uh, the ongoing implications of the drought uh, for all those rural and regional electorates uh, so badly affected by this prolonged dry spell. That's the measure of the man. Uh, we've re-elected him. We wish him well. We know you'll do a good job in this 46th parliament. Congratulations. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And it really is fantastic to be able to uh, give you my well wishes and uh, my uh, congratulations in your election to the speakership today. As you know, Mr Speaker, um, we have been friends and known each other for more than 30 years, uh, attending as we did together Melbourne University. And I remember back in 1988, I was the president of the Student Representative Council, having been elected as a member of the Labor Club. The giants who roamed this stage in, in those days were the likes of uh, Graham Richardson and Robert Ray, and they had a certain prowess as numbers people, which I think in your eyes probably uh, unreasonably gave an aura that rubbed off on me. <laughs> and I remember you bounced into my office, uh, at the, as I was the president of the SRC at the time, you bounced into my office and you said, uh, mate, mate, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be running for the president of the Liberal Club this afternoon. That's good. And I said, uh, he said, so this meeting isn't happening? I said, sure. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, and he said, and if you ever tell anybody, <laughs> he said, mate, if you ever tell anybody about this, I'm going to deny it. <laughs> yeah, no worries. But mate, you're a Labor guy. Tell me how to do the numbers. <laughs> I can assure you that the Speaker did go on to become the president of the Liberal Club that afternoon. Um, and given the oath that you've just taken, uh, Mr Speaker, which of course prevents you from misleading this House, um, you will not be able to deny this story going forward. But uh, I said to you when you became the speaker for the first time that it really was a thrill for those of us who have known you and been friends with you over that period of time. I mean, your politics have always been hopeless, but you have been <laughs> a wonderful guy. And as we have watched you blossom in this role, and you most certainly have, to become one of the really great speakers that this nation has seen, which has led to an honour today in being elected unopposed, and now you will serve in this role for a really significant period of time, which will put you at the very top of the list in terms of people who have contributed as Speaker of this place. I can just say to you, as a lifelong friend, for me to watch you in this role has been an absolute thrill. The Leader of the House. Yeah, after the Leader of the House. <laughs> Steady on. Um, 
Mr Speaker, in that role, I'd like to also add yeah. my congratulations on your re-election to the role of Speaker in the 46th Parliament of the House of Representatives. Of course, great democracies like ours are often described as rules-based systems. And I recall a lecturer in law school in an arcane unit called civil procedure that many in this House would have endured, including yourself, say something to the effect that rules were at the heart of civil procedure and civil procedure was at the inescapable heart of the law. And I remember thinking at the time, this unit sounds completely awful. Um, and indeed, a genuine affinity for civil procedure is a very uncommon thing. And also it could be said that as parliament is at the heart of democracy, so the observance of rules of engagement are always at the heart of parliament. And I further remember that upon first meeting you, Mr Speaker, in the context of one of the many committees that abound in this place, I was struck immediately by the sense of just having met one of those truly rare people who deeply and authentically possess a foundational respect, indeed an almost romantic commitment to process, rules and procedure. And that commitment is as rare as it is unfakeable. And the broad recognition that we are fortunate to have a parliamentarian with a genuine love of our history and procedure in this most important of roles is evident by the manner of your re-election unopposed. So, Mr Speaker, uh, viva la procedure, and <laughs> the government benches look forward to abiding with unending enthusiasm with the wisdom of your rulings. The manager of opposition business. Uh, Mr Speaker, you've made history today. And what's happened today, we shouldn't be lost on the significance of the moment. Uh, the first Speaker in Federation, Speaker Holder, was never opposed and was elected three times unopposed. And no subsequent Speaker has managed that until today. Uh, it speaks volumes uh, for how you have handled the role. It was also the case that uh, while a dissent motion is not a confidence motion, uh, dissent motions have been relatively routine, and more so over the years. Uh, Speaker Holder never had a dissent motion against one of his rulings and never had a vote of no confidence moved against, against him. You have achieved the same. Uh, so what has happened today in the parliament, we shouldn't get lost in the, the and lose the significance of the moment. Uh, so, for you, Mr Speaker, you have been co absolutely consistent in rulings. There have been moments where uh, I've taken a point of order, haven't liked the ruling, uh, but whatever you've ruled, whether it's worked for the government or this side or whatever, you've just kept the consistency and the predictability of your interpretation of the standing orders. You've also allowed the debate to flourish. Uh, I acknowledge the, the presence in the chamber of your predecessor, former, former Speaker Bishop, and one of the comments that was often made from the chair uh, during that time was, we are, we are not just some polite debating society, we are a parliament. And you've allowed the robustness of that debate, uh, the fierceness of that debate to flourish, uh, and allowed at all times the debate on the floor to be the issue rather than yourself. There are many times for members of parliament when someone, on, be it on that side or on this side or on the crossbench, goes through a very difficult time. And when that's occurred, there has effectively been, you know, we talk about the procedural role in here, but there's been, let's call it a pastoral role, call it whatever you want, uh, where you have taken an interest in the welfare of every member of this place. Uh, and those members who've been helped by that reaching out at different points know who they are. But what it has shown is that you have had a determination both to respect the precedence of this place, to keep the order and administration of this place, but to be a speaker for every one of what used to be the 149 people that you look out over, now the, the 150. Uh, and it's because of the way that you've handled that role that today you've made history in a way that no speaker for this parliament since the first parliament has been able to do, and you should be commended for that. The member for Kennedy. Speaker, uh, you recognise that there is other elements in this parliament, except uh, those on your left and those on your right. Uh, and uh, 
we people up here and we deeply appreciate that. Um, I uh, appreciate the personal interest you've taken in me and you've given me holidays on at least two occasions and I thank you sincerely. Uh, and uh, I think we will all endeavour to work uh, cooperatively with you uh, coming into the future. Um, but I think it is important that people in this place represent their constituencies and that's particularly true of the people on the cross benches and uh, you've respected that and we haven't always had that respected and I would uh, crave a little less attention to myself, Mr Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, members, can I say what a, an honour and humbling experience it is to be uh, elected again as your Speaker, uh, elected for the third time uh, unopposed and uh, today to be nominated uh, by the member for Robertson uh, with that nomination, seconded by the member for Corwell. And I thank you both for your very kind words um, during uh, your nomination speeches. Can I thank the Prime Minister, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, and everyone that's spoken for uh, their very kind, uh, and I've got to say humbling words again. Uh, to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, thank you for the history and for uh, everything you said, I'm sure you'll get the call at some point during this parliament. <laughs> we'll ponder that. <laughs> and to the 27 new members, again, uh, I know this is such a special day uh, for all of you. And as I said uh, when we met last week, it is a rare and special honour to be a member of this House of Representatives. Uh, you take the number to just over 1,200, 1,203 members who've served in the House of Representatives since Federation. And uh, that's something we all should reflect on every day uh, that we're here. It really is a rare and special honour. A number of um, uh, the speeches the Prime Minister, Leader of the Opposition, um, pointed out that uh, this is a debating chamber. And it is. It's the arena where the battle of ideas and ideals takes place. And it's right that it should be vigorous and passionate and robust. In fact, there's just been a hard-fought election where uh, members from different political parties have expressed different views on the best way forward for Australia, and they've been elected. So it would be strange if there was unanimous agreement on every single issue after an election. Indeed, it wouldn't be representative <laughs> democracy at its best. But, of course, uh, it is important that the arguments, vigorous, passionate and robust as they are, are carried out in a dignified way. And it's important that there's a balance in all of that. And I've always sought as speaker to try and get that balance right and to be as fair and predictable uh, as I can be. Obviously, question time is very much the focal point of the day, that 70 minutes uh, where that contest is at its most intense. Um, and I do think uh, that there are aspects of question time uh, that we can all improve on, but today is not the day uh, to talk about those matters. Once again, can I, I thank you uh, for the incredible honour of being your speaker, and I look forward very much to presiding over uh, this House in the days, weeks and years that follows in the 46th Parliament. Thank you so much. <laughs> the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have ascertained that it will be his excellently the Governor-General's pleasure to receive you, Mr Speaker, in the Members' Hall immediately after the resumption of sittings at 2.40 p.m. Thank the Prime Minister. Prior to my presentation to His Excellency this afternoon, the bells will be rung for five minutes so that honourable members may attend in the chamber and then accompany me to Members Hall. The sitting is now suspended until approximately 2.40pm this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>